Hey there, my name is Portia Laurie. Welcome to or welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm bringing something to you that's a little different than my average video on my channel. So I don't really know exactly what instigated it. For the last couple of weeks and or maybe months actually, I have been obsessing over a true crime story you might be familiar with. Does anyone remember that burglary gang that was kind of taking over Calabasas and Hollywood in 2008, 2009, better known as the Bling Ring. Well, I've been just diving into every piece of media I can find on the case. I have thoughts and I have opinions and I need to get them out of my head. Today, we're going to be diving into this true crime story about a burglary gang of teenagers, instead of just wishing for the Hollywood lifestyle that they saw in all the tabloids, decided that they could be a part of that scene. Now, if you like to hear my opinions on all things pop culture, movies, music, TV shows, do me a solid and drop a like on this video. As always, if you wanna follow me outside of YouTube, all of that will be linked down in the description. I am on a podcast with my boyfriend and his best friend Daniel and all we do is talk about movies. We pick a different movie every week. It's a lot of fun and I'd love if you joined us. So that will be linked in the description down below, the Cinema Sit Down Podcast. So in today's video, I not only want to talk about the story of the Bling Ring and what happened to the people who were doing the crimes and what the outcome was, I also want to compare this to the 2013 Sofia Coppola movie that is... I, we're gonna just have to get into it when we get there. Editing Portia here to say that I'd like to preface this video with the fact that I've never covered true crime before on my channel and it's a lot tougher than it seems. So I apologize for the amount of times I'm gonna say allegedly. I also want to preface that I found a lot of conflicting information online. So there are some details of the crime that I chose to leave out due to not having enough sufficient evidence to back up what I was saying. Bling Ring. If you've never heard of this case, let me give you like a quick overview and then we'll dive into some of the details. In 2008 slash 2009, a group of teenagers was going around the Hollywood Hills, breaking in and robbing from various famous celebrities. They were eventually caught utilizing the security camera footage and ultimately brought to justice later in 2009. Rachel Lee, who I would say is probably one of the more notorious of the group. She is the alleged ringleader of this burglary bunch, already had kind of a past with petty crime. He had gotten kicked out of Calabasas High School, ended up going to Indian Hills Alternative High School, which is where we will meet Nick Prugo. Now, Nick Prugo has presented himself as being someone who's very insecure, really wanting to fit in, and feeling like an outsider. Rachel then introduced Nick to Diane Anna Tamayo, who was a close friend of hers at Indian Hills. She was known for being student body president. Somehow Alexis Nyers and her sister Tess Taylor were friends or part of the circle that ran with Rachel. She says that they were just valley kids that would go to parties and that's kind of how they knew each other. More so acquaintances than like close knit friends. Next we have Courtney Ames, who was actually a friend of Nick Perugo's. She was known for having a really high GPA. She was very well liked and she was also friends with Rachel. Roy Lopez Jr., who was a previous co-worker of Courtney's, they worked together in a restaurant. And we have Johnny Ajar, who was a club promoter, pretty popular in the LA scene. Prior to the events of the Bling Ring, he, when he was living in Wyoming, at 22, he had been arrested and was convicted for drug trafficking charges. Rachel and Nick met sometime in the span between early 2008 and like fall of 2008. So Nick and Rachel bond over their shared love, passion for celebrities and reality TV and fashion, gossip culture, which in 2008 was the absolute height of tabloids, gossip, blogs. It was the wild, wild west of tabloid culture at this time. And they begin doing this thing that Nick calls checking cars. If they were unlocked, they would rummage through the car, taking whatever they could find that was of value and going on about their night. Now, allegedly per Nick's account, this was really successful for them. This is something that helped aid in their DRUG addictions, which that is something that he says began immediately upon hanging out with Rachel. 
allegedly. And basically the checking of cars is what was funding their drug habits as well as their spending habits. Nick would say that they would get all of these random credit cards from these cars and then they would drive out to Rodeo the following day or various other shopping locations in LA and they would just use them. Started to kind of dry up neighborhoods. Like they really weren't finding the big bus like they were finding before. Now allegedly in October of 2008, Nick and Rachel were allegedly looking online at TMZ and various blogs and whatnot, the tabloids, and they were trying to find a celebrity that might be dumb enough to leave their front door unlocked. They stumbled across Paris Hilton and unfortunately, they were right. By the way, when they were looking up online, they found that Paris is hosting a club party in Vegas. So that's how they know that she shouldn't, she, she shouldn't be home. Nick claims that he looked up online where Paris Hilton lives, looked at the Google Maps, tried to figure out the best way to secure entry into the place. They find their way up to Paris's. And so they knock on the door, no one answers and they're looking for a way to get inside. And so Rachel just tries the door and wouldn't you know it, it's unlocked. So this is our first break-in of many break-ins into Paris's residence. Now, after their first break-in at Paris's, there wasn't any buzz online. Nick says that he was going on TMZ constantly to see if Paris was gonna report having been burgled and nothing ever came of it. So what do teenagers do that think there are no consequences to something? They keep doing it. Allegedly, Nick and Rachel broke into Paris Hilton's house over four to five times during the span of October 2008 to December 2008. But in all of the robberies of Paris's house, it's alleged that they stole hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of belongings of Paris's, as well as family heirlooms, and even nude photos of Paris that were hidden in her closet. Nick also alleges that they found a lot of a certain type of white substance, but Paris Hilton's publicists claim that this is a lie. Now, I think the accounts of this are a little fuzzy due to the movies that have since come out about the bling ring, but allegedly they didn't bring a whole lot of people with them, but it's also alleged that they may or may not have brought Courtney at one point to Paris's, and it's also alleged that maybe Alexis was there as well, but there is no footage, there is nothing to corroborate this, so it's all speculation allegedly. Courtney gave information to Roy Lopez Jr. about Paris's, how, how to get in, how easy it was to steal, allegedly. But when he broke into Paris's house, he stole $2 million worth of jewelry and walked out of the house with it in a Louis Vuitton bag, allegedly. After Paris's house becomes like persona non grata for them, they move on to their next target. And in February of 2009, that target would be Audrina Patridge. Now with Paris Hilton, I didn't feel like I needed to reference who she is, but for Audrina, I'll give you a little bit of background on who she is in case you're unaware. Audrina was casted on The Hills, a very, very popular reality show for MTV. Now, I would say in 2009, this is the height of reality TV sh show stars. Nick and Rachel picked Audrina as their next victim due to the fact that she was scheduled to attend an Oscar party on this evening. And so it was going to be kind of a very good time to be pilfering because all the celebrities were busy being out and about. But they were ultimately caught on Audrina's security footage. During this robbery, it is alleged that they stole around $45,000 worth of belongings, this including her laptop and a custom pair of jeans. Now with the Audrina robbery, they were caught on her security footage, but since this was the first time the burglary ring had been caught on tape, there was no one to account for who these people might be. Even though the security camera footage was posted online on Audrina's own website, I could see how there weren't a lot of people to really connect the dots just yet. Now after Audrina's, during the spring of 2009, the Nick and Rachel, allegedly began robbing Rachel Bilson's house. And this is another house where they went back several times. Rachel Bilson at this time, if you did not know who Rachel Bilson is, she is a famous actress. She was on the OC, which was 
huge at this time. I believe she was dating Hayden Christensen and she was also an up and coming fashion girly. She was kind of known for having really good taste and she was constantly being seen carrying Chanel bags, which if you know anything about fashion, you know Chanel bags aren't cheap. So allegedly the crew burgled from Rachel Bilson's house several times in the spring of 2009, allegedly stealing around $300,000 worth of belongings. Members of the bling ring have been quoted as saying that the amount of items that they were able to take from Rachel Bilson's was so much, they ended up selling some of it on the Venice boardwalk. Could you imagine have been, being like a tourist and, and you're in from out of town and you're just here to see the Venice boardwalk because you know, it's famous and then you see just a bunch of kids selling a bunch of Chanel purses. You probably look at them and think, oh, those aren't real. Like, I'll just buy one. And who knows, maybe that Chanel purse was actually Rachel Bilson's and it's just in Ohio right now. Like, isn't that, I don't know. I just thought that that was wild that they had like the audacity to do it like right there out in the open. But that's kind of like an underlayer of things that were going on during this time. I haven't really gotten into it. They were trying to steal items, but once they were done with some of the items, especially like the clothing and shoes and things like that, I imagine that they were all trying to sell them off to not kind of hold on to some of this stuff for too long. Now, this isn't like verified across everyone. Like I said, everyone has a completely different version of events or they're just not willing to talk to the media whatsoever. So it's really hard to understand exactly what happened with all the items. I don't think that much of it was recovered and then returned back to the celebrities. I think it was probably very minuscule if anything was actually given back. I also feel like it's vaguely important to bring this up only for the sheer fact that it gives you some kind of idea of the mind frame of some of the people involved but it is alleged that Rachel felt so comfortable at Rachel Bilson's that she actually used the facilities while she was there. I, I know that that's like such a random note, but you have to be on a different level of comfortable to be committing a crime and then also feeling like, well, I have to kind of like, I have to pee, so I'm just gonna go do that now. Like that should give you an idea of how much allegedly they did not care about the repercussions and what they were doing to these celebrities by breaking and entering into their homes. In July of 2009, the group set their sights on Orlando Bloom. Orlando was out of town filming at a home in LA, obviously. And at the time, his girlfriend was living there with him, who was Miranda Kerr. So the group sets their sights on Orlando Bloom. And this is another entry where the bling ring was caught on security footage. They cut a hole in the fence and then they all had like hooded sweatshirts on. So what they did is they flipped their hoods over their head and then they walked backwards towards the inside of the house to try to keep themselves from getting caught. Now, I'm assuming later on in the footage, cause I haven't seen all of it, I really only remember that opening beginning part because it, it feels like a horror movie. But I would assume later on in the footage, there must be some facial recognition or they must turn in a way because Alexis is caught in this footage. Now, allegedly, Alexis says she was super high out of her mind during this event. She has very little to no recollection of what actually happened. And mostly what she did remember is the overwhelming feeling of being in someone else's home, realizing this is all real. And she allegedly threw up outside and used the bathroom. But at Orlando's, they did steal over $500,000 worth of belongings allegedly. Now Nick has claimed this was a huge pull because prior to this, most of the targets had been women because Rachel wanted women's clothes for obvious reasons. But Nick said that this was the first time that he was going to someone where he actually felt like he benefited, I guess, in some kind of way. Amongst all the belongings that they stole and cash that they found, allegedly. They also stole Orlando Bloom's vintage collection of Rolex watches. I think that maybe is why Orlando Bloom was so adamant about finding these people and bringing them to justice. I'm sure that collection probably meant more to him than just being merchandise. I think something that was happening in the media during this time, as someone who was following the story as it was developing, I, I'm not proud of this. I was really into tabloid culture at this time. I definitely was reading Perez Hilton, even if I didn't and agree with his opinions. I wanted to know everything that was going on in Hollywood, but I don't remember people taking this case 
very seriously. I feel like that's due completely to the fact that these were so rich celebrities being stolen from and people kind of not caring because they're rich. And regardless of the amount of money, the amount of items, the things stolen, it's the sense of like any privacy that was absolutely ripped away from these celebrities. As with the Audrina security footage, Orlando Bloom also got footage of these kids, which was ultimately posted on TMZ. And I think this is around the, the time that TMZ also posted the footage along with Audrina's for comparison. And this is when people started realizing that this might all be the same group of people. So their next big hit in August of 2008 would be Brian Austin Green's home that he shared with then girlfriend and eventual wife and ex-wife, Megan Fox. Rachel was a very big fan of Megan Fox, really enjoyed her style. I somehow excluded the information that I had for what happened at Brian Austin Green and Megan Fox's home, but um, the important note is that they stole a bunch of merchandise, clothing, whatnot, but they also stole a semi-automatic you-know-what, and that was later found at Johnny Ajar's home. And now we get into the grand finale of the crimes, Lindsay Lohan. Nick says he eventually found Lindsay's home. They guarantee that she was going to be out at a some kind of fashion event or party. And so this was their time, this was their moment to break in. And allegedly, when they broke in, they said that the entire place was completely not trashed, but like there was just items everywhere. According to Nick's transcript of the events that happened at Lindsay's home, he was always concerned about getting caught or when the celebrity would get home. He was very, very concerned about the security footage that was on TMZ. So from his point of view, it was very anxiety inducing, but from the description he gives of Rachel, she was always just super confident, super comfortable at all times. It's also alleged around this time that Rachel had been planning to move to Las Vegas to live with her father for a while. So when they were at Orlando's, Brian Austin Green's, and I believe Lindsay's as well, she was stealing uh, decorative pieces, artwork as well, to then furnish her eventual Vegas pad, allegedly. But the next day on TMZ, it was reported absolutely everywhere, it was blasted online, that Lindsay Lohan had been burgled from and there was security footage of the, of the burglars in action. And this would ultimately lead to the arrest of the players of the bling ring. Nick would be the first to be arrested and interrogated by the police. And at first, Nick didn't budge at all. He said he had no, he had no prior knowledge to these crimes. He had no involvement, yada, yada, yada. But allegedly Nick was overwhelmed with crippling anxiety from all the events and from lying. And he decided just to come out and confess. He also ended up flipping on basically the entire crew and turned them all in. Rachel Lee was one of the last to be arrested as she had moved to Las Vegas. As Nyers was named in Orlando Bloom's security footage, so she was also arrested. This is an arrest we'll also talk about in a little bit because Yo, it's wild. Courtney Ames, Johnny Ajar, and Roy Lopez Jr. were also all arrested uh, shortly after Nick's confession. This video was already getting insanely long, so I opted to just throw up on screen what the sentencing was for everyone involved in the crime, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about some of these outcomes later on in the video. Let's talk about the 2022 documentary, The Real Bling Ring, Hollywood Heist. In 2022, a British production company decided they wanted to make a documentary regarding the bling ring. And they were able to secure two of the members that were convicted for some of the crimes, Nick Prugo and Alexis Nyers. Now, I'm not gonna dive like super, super deep into this. I just kind of want to give an overview. The documentary also features Audrina Patridge, who divulges a little bit about her story and her involvement with the bling ring and kind of a little bit about how this affected her and her life moving forward and during this time. Now, an important note as well is that Alexis Nyers was on a reality show with her family called Pretty Wild. Pretty Wild was originally 
pitched as like a hippie version of the Kardashians. It was going to feature Alexis, her pseudo sister, Tess Taylor, as well as her younger sister, Gabby, and their mother, and kind of showing their more relaxed, free-spirited version of live of a family in Calabasas with daughters who are trying to break into the business. This show ended up being filmed during the beginnings of the arrest for the bling ring. And the reality show ended up kind of being re-navigated to focus on Alexis and the trial. And what did we learn in this documentary? I feel like it does divulge a little bit more into the details regarding where everyone's mental status was at, what they were thinking going into these crimes, and kind of how they were able to continue the spree. I would say that Nick is probably the main narrator for most of the actual robberies and break-ins he gives um, more of a detailed account of what these situations look like and their headspace going into each robbery. They also show you the research aspect that went into what they did to figure out where these celebrities lived and how to get into how to access their homes even though they live in these highly secure neighborhoods allegedly. Along with every time that Nick mentions one of their various crimes that they committed, it kind of shows you on the screen what the typical sentencing is for those crimes. Now while Nick comes across as though he's more open to taking responsibility for the crimes that he and Rachel committed, Nick's account of events is quite different from Alexis's. But one thing it seems that Nick and Alexis both do agree on is the fact that in the Sofia Coppola movie they really cast it as Alexis being or the Alexis type character being the so quote-unquote ringleader of the group whereas both Nick and Alexis are on the same page as far as like she was a a side character if you will in these crimes and was not a main lead and the media really casted her as the ultimate villain in the situation when in reality her connection with the crew was kind of distant. So as far as my thoughts or takeaways from the documentary, I have thoughts and I have feelings. They didn't really fully feel like Nick or Alexis was fully taking responsibility for their actions within this documentary. That could be clever editing, that could be just the way that the documentary was supposed to go, it was supposed to kind of more, maybe it was supposed to be more of an account of the crimes and what happened and the result of that. It, it just feels as though there's a missing piece of consciousness from either party. When Nick is kind of divulging his story, his version of events, it seems to be centered around like laughter and I don't know if that's like nervous laughter for having to talk about these, you know, really intense crimes that he committed over a decade ago or if that's more of just he feels really nonchalant uh, when looking back at these events. And from Alexis's point of view, it does come across really defensive. I don't think that she was making things up. That she definitely has a documented history of drug abuse. So the fact that that was part of, you know, her version of events does line up, it makes sense. And I don't want to discredit um, what she's been through regarding the addiction aspect. But when it came to these crimes that affected these people, I never really got the impression that in either party felt particularly guilty about it. I just didn't feel like they cared that much about how their actions ultimately affected all of these celebrities. I really don't feel like the media or anyone cared about how this so much affected these celebrities. They trespassed into their home. You've taken like the one piece of privacy that these people really have and trampled on it. It is wild to me that I, I just didn't feel like that message was carried home for them. It's, it's pretty wild to me. Ah, pretty wild. But Rachel Bilson has been very vocal about her indifference regarding the media attention around the bling ring. She is a victim of their robberies and she has said that this has really traumatized her. They took really sentimental things that she can never ever ever replace from her aside from all of the 
designer pieces that they took. And that really resonated with me. I don't think many people really cared, you know, what Paris Hilton was feeling after her home was robbed numerous times. And I don't care, again, that they have the money to replace all the items. It's not that. It's the fact that they just didn't care about them as human beings. While I was researching for this video and researching into the bling ring, I did come across that during the press run for the documentary that Alexis Nyers and her younger sister Gabby on Rachel Bilson's podcast. But to see Rachel Bilson kind of come full circle and have a sit down interview conversation with someone who committed a really big crime against her, I thought was insane. This is where Gabby had alleged that she actually broke into Rachel Bilson's home. But both of them apologized to her. Rachel allegedly uh, accepts their apology and feels that it's genuine, wants them all to move on, and then also divulges what her life was like during the burglaries and what it's been like afterwards. But the person that I was most kind of surprised by in the documentary and that kind of changed my perspective on Alexis was her mother, Andrea. I think anyone who takes a moment to watch this documentary will understand what I'm talking about because she comes across extremely naive, um, especially in regards to what her daughters were going through at this time. It seems to me that she was very aloof around the entire situation and that she really wasn't doing a great job of being a parent, in my opinion. It very much seems as though she didn't know or doesn't know how to take responsibility for her own actions and the role that she plays as being, you know, the mom and i'm not saying alexis is like guilt-free or innocent by any means didn't seem like she had a firm figure in her life telling her right from wrong now before we get into the dumpster fire that is sofia coppola's movie and maybe that's maybe that's a little too aggressive maybe it's not a dumpster fire but i definitely don't really care for the movie very much anymore they had made a tv version of the bling ring a couple years prior to sofia coppola's coming out unfortunately I opted not to rent it because it was too expensive. But if you wanna catch it, I'm pretty sure it's streaming on Amazon Prime and your boy Austin Butler's in it. So now it's time, the finale of this video. Let's talk about the Sofia Coppola 2013 movie, the Bling Ring. The 2013 Sofia Coppola movie, The Bling Ring, was based on the Vanity Fair article written by Nancy Jo Sales, The Suspects Wore Louboutins. This article is quite infamous. And at this time, Alexis really wanted to change the narrative, change the perspective around her to try to feign innocence, right? The producers of Pretty Wild got her in contact with someone at Vanity Fair. They agreed to do this interview and it was supposed to be just this thing to, to help her improve her image. Wrong? Wrong. So this article completely just obliterated any chance Alexis ever had of pleading not guilty in this case or having any kind of positive reputation in the media. So this is heavily depicted in her reality show. We see Nancy Jo Sales even appearing on screen with Alexis. We see a very, 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 very small portion of the interview. And then later we see Alexis getting the issue of Vanity Fair and reading the article and the aftermath of that. This results in this very, very, very infamous scene from the reality show that I'm sure you've seen on TikTok or in a YouTube short or just in another YouTube commentary about the bling ring. But she called Nancy Joe to tell her how much, how disappointed she was in the article, how she had completely defamed her, and how she was going to, karma was going to come back to get her. Upon my first watch of watching The Bling Ring back in 2013, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a bopping good time to be totally honest. Uh, it didn't really feel like they were trying to expose The Bling Ring or expose why they shouldn't have done what they were doing. It definitely felt like more of just like a flashy teen movie of about some kids that commit a crime. Now that I'm an adult looking back at this from different, more analytical eyes, I have a lot of problems with this movie. This isn't so much a problem, but I think it's more of a distraction. So something that I immediately noticed upon rewatching this movie is how hyper stylized, how aesthetic-y, how 
it the film appears now first of all i do want to say the the movie looks beautiful the color choices how saturated it is it definitely gives me 2016 like youtube girly vibes like back to school like very alicia marie but that was what was in at the time so looks appeal wise i totally get it i also really enjoyed that in the opening scene the first thing that we see is their break into orlando blooms and then the music hits and the first notes of the music sound like an alarm going off I thought that that was very fitting and kind of kind of a cool way to start the movie. I also really enjoyed that far out perimeter shot when they are stealing from Audrina Patrick's house of them just going in and out of different doors, going through her house, pilfering all the stuff and then leaving. One of my gripes with this movie is the fact that the aesthetic, while pleasing to the eye, does not match the era in which these robberies took place. But the aesthetic for this movie is very, very, very much 2012, 2013 when the movie actually came out. And while I can understand that from some perspective, like obviously you're trying to appeal to teenagers of that era right then and right there, I feel like it negated the actual real aspects of the movie. But something that I thought would have been extremely interesting and like better for the movie was to base the entire thing in the era that it happened. I should be seeing Ed Hardy still. I should be seeing Von Dutch and various trucker hats. I should be seeing like Kat Von D style makeup. And yes, I know that they changed all the main characters names. So to some degree, I'm supposed to like separate the real story from this story, but then they use footage from the actual time frame that these robberies were taking place. So it's kind of doesn't make any sense. In 2013, Audrina Patridge was not nearly as relevant as she was in 2008. So I feel like these small changes uh, don't make sense with the story that they're trying to tell. There are some on the point things like they go to Kitson, which was a huge brand in that era of celebrity culture. We also see Mark in like a different scarf every scene for like the majority of the mid portion of the movie. Very 2008. Uh, it's the only thing that they leaned on. I feel like I should be seeing a lot more bandage style dresses. I feel like I should be seeing more neon colors. Seeing kid era and I didn't really see anyone dress like that. It wasn't quite right. Like the aesthetic is just slightly off and it bugs me to no end. During one of the first break-ins, which I didn't mention earlier, but they had actually broken into the home of a friend of Nick's who went to Woodland High. Now in the film version of this, Rebecca is wearing a statement necklace and harem pants, which in 2008 and 2009 were not cool yet. Like maybe it was an LA thing and maybe you could talk it up to like her being a little ahead of the edge, but more her style looks very effervescent of 2012 Tumblr. And then uh, lastly, the music. It's not that the music itself is bad, it's bad for this movie. All of the Lights by Kanye West came out in 2010, 2011. Bad Girls by M.I.A. also came out in 2012. It's all over the place. Set the movie in the era that the events took place. You want it to be real and about the actual story or did you want it to be some kind of made up story that just was based on true events. Pick a lane. Now something else I didn't love about this movie is that I felt like there was just a lot of blank space, a lot of just empty pages, and this was all filled with that aesthetic filtering that I was mentioning earlier. I don't know if this is poor writing, I don't know if it's poor acting, but I'm going to assume it's kind of a little bit of a mixture of the two because you don't really understand the connections between these characters the only understanding is that they like to party and they like to do drugs and they like to steal stuff. I think a more interesting story would be the development of these relationships because by, you know, the ending of things, Nick had mentioned how him and Rachel were not on great terms anymore. He wasn't, he didn't feel like she was confiding in him like he, she used to, you know, and all of that would have made for really interesting perspectives. Not that it would necessarily shine a better light on any of these kids, but just to give a more 
grounded understanding of why they were doing what they were doing and why they kept doing it. There's the scene where we see Claire driving and they just came back from Paris. They've got all this stuff in their car. She's singing the bad girl song and then they get into a car accident. The lead up to the car accident takes forever. There's another scene where we see Mark dancing to drop it low and smoking um, that good, good grass. This was ripped, one of those ripped from the headlines type of thing. And even the same song um, back in the day during the height of the crime, crimes going on, which again, I'm telling you like, what era did you want to put this in? The Audrina break in while aesthetically pleasing to look at is an astronomically long scene that does not need to be as long as it is. And then there's one other one where Mark and Rebecca are driving back from another burglary and they're just in the car. We only see the headlights and there's a brief, brief moment where Mark asks Rebecca if she would ever steal from him and she says no. This scene is also just entirely too long. So this next part is what I think I have the biggest problem with in regards to the Bling Ring movie. Let's get into the Nikki Alexis debacle. So in Sofia Coppola's version, I definitely feel like she got the fame hungry idiot treatment as far as character personality types. They did cast Emma Watson to play the Nikki Alexis coded character. It's being reported that the movie roles that she's trying to go after are going to be a departure from Hermione and what would be a bigger departure from the kind of perfect smart Hermione Granger than to play this kind of dimwit wannabe socialite criminal and I have thoughts and I have opinions. Don't know how to feel about Emma Watson's portrayal. On one side, she claims like in interviews and stuff that she was just watching reality TV and watching kind of people that would go on to inspire the character of Nikki. But to say that she got, that it's not just supposed to be a derivative of Alexis Nyers would be, I think, inappropriate. I think it's very clear that between the script writer and the vision for the film, they definitely wanted the Nikki character to be Alexis adjacent, but more over the top. Even Nick Prugo mentions in the documentary, and I think it, he brings up a valid point, but him and Rachel were more so the leaders of this group. So when you put the most high profile actors in those two roles and then fill the rest of the crew with unknowns as Sophia's vision was. And I kind of have to agree with that. I did, I did it. I definitely felt like the Bling Ring movie is the Alexis Nyers story. Is this about her rise to infamy or is this about the bling ring? And I want to reiterate, I don't have sympathy per se for Alexis and her involvement in the crimes. Like I don't have sympathy for that. You made a choice. You have to live with those consequences. However, I do think her portrayal in the media and how she was pushed forward as the leader and was really taking the the brunt of it from a media standpoint, I do think that that was manipulative and wrong. And I don't, I don't think she necessarily deserved that or at least didn't deserve it more than any other member of the bling ring. There's also another moment which I'm like, I wonder if originally they did have the characters named after the real people and then later had to change it for like fear of being sued. But there is a slip up where Alexis is there and she brings along her younger sister, Gabby. Now in the movie, this character's name is Emily, but in this scene, Emma Watson accidentally calls her Gabby. So like to say that this wasn't based on Alexis Nyers would be completely asinine. You very clearly had this idea of what this person was like and ran with it. That damn line where she's like, I wanna rob. I really do hate that line. There is no good way. I don't think anyone could have delivered that line. That line should just never have existed in the movie, period. I do have to say, however, that I think the casting of Leslie Mann as the Andrea character, perfection. Andrea Arlington, like she nailed her perfectly. She had similar mannerisms, the way she delivered lines, her talking, just like Leslie Mann just like killed it in this role, even though she's in like 0.5 scenes, 
killed it as Andrea Arlington. Another big thing I really don't like about this movie, and apparently the Lifetime movie also has a similar depiction, but there is a complete exclusion of the character of Diana Tamayo. Now this is important because while I didn't mention her a whole lot during the crime spree, she definitely was part of it. I mentioned earlier how she was known for her small stature, whom I believe crawled in through like a doggy door to get into like one of the houses. I don't remember which one of them. They have completely eliminated her character and I don't know why because I don't know what they're trying to protect. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Diana Tamayo was allegedly an immigrant and here illegally. And she, the police allegedly used this against her in order to get her to confess and to reveal more about the crimes and everyone's involvement. Now, to completely disregard this as part of the the ring, the, the criminals, seems like a big whitewashing of the story. That's very, 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 very frustrating to me. Extremely frustrating. I can't believe they got Gavin Rosdale to play the Johnny Ajar character. I'm just gonna mention that. Another thing that the movie inadvertently failed at is the fact that Sofia Coppola worked with Brett Goodkin, who was the lead investigator on this crime. But you know what Brett didn't do? Because Brett fumbled the bag, didn't clear it with his bosses to ensure that he would be able to legally help and work on and appear in the Sofia Coppola version of events. They depict this in the documentary as well. And a reporter calls Brett's, uh, the district attorney, I believe, and says like, hey, how do you feel about one of your officers in this trial that is still currently going on is working on the Sofia Coppola ver movie? Like, how do you feel about that? And she's like, I'm sorry, what? So this resulted in Brett Goodkin eventually being investigated. And that is also why Courtney Ames, uh, Roy Lopez Jr., Johnny Ajar, and Diana Tamayo got off with pretty much a slap on the wrist and some probation. But yeah, they completely fumbled the bag and they actually, this movie got in the way of real justice being served. It is definitely brought up time and time again in the documentaries and in interviews, so I know that this has got to have an air of truth to it, but the entire group was doing a lot of DRUGs and partying a lot. And we see that depicted in the movie, but we are not seeing any of the effects of that in the movie. Like, the characters are doing these substances but do you see a difference in personality? Do you see them behaving any differently than they do the rest of the time when they're supposedly sober? I didn't. So that was like a flaw, I thought. Like there are drugs, but there are no consequences to taking the drugs. There are crimes, but there's not really punishment for the crimes. So at the end of the movie, I posed this question because I watched this along with my boyfriend, Jerry, and I posed this question to both of us. What purpose did this movie serve? Questionable. I really don't know what this movie was trying to do besides be aesthetically pleasing and have a banging soundtrack. Cause that soundtrack is banging. But that's kind of the Sofia Coppola movie, I guess. I don't know how I feel about it. Like I've, I've done a lot more research. I feel like I know a lot more given the research I've done and watching the documentary. I feel like I know a lot more about the bling ring, but I still don't know anything about really what these kids were thinking at the time. And that is the most frustrating part. I feel like there are so many different ways they could have depicted this movie that would have felt refreshing or like they were adding something to the story, to the dialogue regarding these kids and this era and why they did what they did. Two just quick ideas I had that could have made Sophia's movie so much better in my opinion is A, I wish that she had gone full bore. If you're gonna change all the names, why not just set it in 2013 when the movie came out? Why not just set it in the era that it is? Tell the story of the bling ring but just like make it up a little bit, you know? Have the celebrities be more celebrities that are pro profound in that era, you know? Uh, change it up just so that it's more, it feels more like it's happening right now, like it was in 08. Make it up with it loosely being tied to this real event story. That would have been fine. Then that would have given her enough creative abilities to make up the personalities, to add in all the information that we wish we knew, to sh depict 
their character flaws better to to fully realize these characters outside of just being fame hungry and then the other side of that if she wanted to tell the story of the bling ring i guess you could still change the character names but like keep it consistent tell the story that the public knows and instead of focusing it on the kids and the criminals why not focus it from the perspective of the investigators? Um, I mentioned this in my, based on a true story, um, that video I did that was mostly regarding uh, horror movies that are based on true events, but this would be kind of a, a, in a similar vein. If they had followed this story, but from the perspective of the investigators, from the perspective of a slight outsider, from the perspective of like a mom trying to figure out like what they're up to, like. There are so many different ways that I feel like would have been way more interesting, would have gotten into more of the psyche behind what they were thinking that would have just like given more to the story would be to take one of those alternative routes. But that's just my opinion. But that's the bling ring in a nutshell. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. What did you follow this story when it was happening? Had you ever heard of the bling ring? What are your thoughts on the Sofia Coppola movie? Tell me everything down below. I, I'm really glad that I've made this video because I feel like I've gotten the majority of my thoughts and opinions out there and so I can kind of let it go. But who knows, maybe I'll find myself just in another hole of trying to figure out more information about this, who knows. But if you enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed my opinion on, on a true crime case and the depictions across the media of this story, let me know by hitting that like button. And if you enjoy listening to my opinion, all things pop culture, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button as well. If you wanna see more behind the scenes of me or what my life is like when I'm not standing in this corner of my apartment, do me a solid and follow me on my social medias. They will be all linked in the description below. As I said before, I'm on a podcast right now. It's called The Cinema Sit Down. You can find that linked in the description below as well. We're available on iTunes and Spotify. We so make sure to go give us a listen. And until next time, I'll catch you guys later. Bye.